Sunday festival. It's so nice to see so many of you. And today we have a special guest. We have His Holiness Bhakti Vigyan Goswami Maharaj with us. He's gonna come shortly, but he needs 10 more minutes. So many of you are Russian speaking, I know, and we will continue with our translation. And for those of you who haven't been in the previous classes so far, if you don't know how to receive the translation, you can go to the room there, Prashadam room. And Yamuna Kelly Mataji, she's not here yet, unfortunately. She will explain to you how it works. It's working on a Telegram chat. So I guess you all have the Telegram on your phone. So the simultaneous trans uh, translation will happen there. And then maybe if we can just all move a little bit more in because more devotees are coming in the back. Please, Hare Krishna, if you can come more to this side, move closer. पतित पावन करने ताई की हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे Hare 
Krishna, 
हर कृष्ण हरे कृष्णा कृष्ण कृष्ण हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे Thank you all very much for coming to this Sunday program and we want to welcome our special guest His Holiness Bhakti Vigyan Goswami Maharaj by loudly chanting Hari Bo Hari Bo Hari Bo So Maharaj for those of you who don't know him I'm sure most of you know him He's a sannyasi a traveling preacher in the renounced order of life in ISKCON and is also serving as a initiating spiritual master and many of you are his disciples that's why the temple room is so packed today <laughs> and today we're going to hear from Maharaj about the topic mantra meditation as we said before there's a Russian translation of a telegram if you want to know how it how to connect Yamuna Kelly Mata she's there in the other room, and maybe versteht irgendjemand kein Englisch? Deutsch? Hier gibt es noch eine deutsche Übersetzung bei Krishna Prima Hupa Anyone here for the first time? Very nice, welcome to you. 
So, just that you know what's happening now, we have a lecture, a ph philosophical discourse, until around five o'clock. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj, for visiting us after actually quite a long time. Maharaj came here the last 16 or 17 years ago. So, thank you. Long okay. enough. <laughs> Should I finish at 5 o'clock Swiss time <laughs> or Indian time? <laughs> okay. We are Indian religions. Radha <laughs> Jaya Kunja Bihari Jaya Radha Madhava Jaya Radha Madhava Jaya Kunja Bihari Pijana Vallabha Jaya Giri Jaya Giri Jana Bala Bha Jaya Giri Varadari Jaya Giri Yashodhanandana Vrajajanaranjana Yashodhanandana Vrajajanaranjana Yashodana Andana Brajajana Ranjana Yashodana Andana Tira Vanachari Tira Vanachari Jaya Radha Madhava Jaya Kunjave Hare
जयो राध माधवा जय कुंज बिहारे भक्ति जानवा जय गिरीवार धरे जय गिरीवार धरे जय यशोदना ब्रज जानरंजना यशोदना ब्रज जानरंजना यशोदना ब्रज जानरंजना यमुना तेरा वन चारे यमुना तेरा वन चारे जय राधा माधवा जय कुंज बेहारे जय राध माधवा जय कुंज बिहारे हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 रामा हरे रामा राम राम हरे 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 कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 
हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे very eager to taste Krishna Prasadam. <laughs> but little hunger helps to uh, experience the taste better, so I will delay this experience for some time by talking <laughs> on the designated topic. And I was asked to speak about Japa meditation. Meditation is a very famous and common word nowadays. <coughs> Originally it comes from the word dhyana. And the word dhyana is Sanskrit word dhyana. It's coming from the uh, verbal root dhi. Uh, which actually designates uh, the intelligence. The uh, means uh, the ability to concentrate deeply on uh, some object. <coughs> if we take Vedic literature uh, or Vedic culture in general, uh, we will be able to understand that uh, the previously people were all very intelligent and they had very uh, calm and concentrated mind and they were knowing uh, the events of this world not by the means of experiment as uh, people do nowadays uh, by uh, uh, certain mistakes and you know making experiment uh, it's a long and arduous process of knowing the truth in the Vedic culture people would investigate the world and know exactly how to deal with this world how to uh, act in this world in a proper way and how to use all the uh, things which are surrounding us just by meditation so the Vedic process of knowing things is to concentrate the mind completely on certain object and uh, unite with this object through this process of concentration. And this unification with the objects through the process of uh, concentration would give them uh, immense deal of information of what 
uh, this object is all about, what is the use of this object, uh, what uh, can I do with it, so on and so forth. Like, for example, in Ayurveda, there are literally thousands of different herbs uh, described uh, you know, 3,000 years back, 2,500 years back, people knew exactly what is the usage of each and every uh, herb uh, and what, how it will affect our consciousness, how it will affect our body. So, how did they do this? There was no chemical laboratories, there was no uh, modern equipment to do it. Uh, the answer is simple, meditation. <coughs> Uh, this process of knowing things is called uh, yogi japratyaksha. It's the experiment through yoga. And yoga means connection. Yoga means unification. Yoga means uh, the destruction of the uh, impediment between me and uh, the object of my meditation. Because usually I remind myself uh, I am in my selfish uh, little world and uh, 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 therefore I only know very limited whatever my senses allow uh, to come and even this knowledge which is coming through the senses are quite distorted. But uh, yogis they knew the secret. How to concentrate on certain thing and by uniting the consciousness, the heart, with this particular thing to understand uh, what's going on, what is the nature of this particular object I want to investigate. So this is called Yogi Ji Pratyaksha. Pratyaksha means experimental knowledge, but it's uh, diametrically opposed to the method of experimental knowledge adopted by the modern science. Uh, but it's definitely not less effective. It's actually much more effective because it can reveal the information which is still hidden uh, by the uh, conventional processes adopted by the science. Uh, but uh, we're talking about special kind of meditation. Uh, what I described right now is the process of meditation on the material objects. But uh, in the ultimate sense, our uh, inquiry, our inquisitiveness, our desire to know the truth is extended uh, to understand the absolute truth. Every human being, uh, whoever he may be, he may be Indian, he may be Chinese, he may be Russian, believe it or not, uh, he may be a Swiss person, Whoever he is, it doesn't matter, by nature uh, has this deep down in his consciousness, in his heart, this question, uh, who I am and what is the ultimate truth? This is the mm, innate nature of every uh, human being. We are inquirers. We are seekers of the truth. And we are not satisfied with the partial truth. Partial truth is available to us through different means, but if we are talking about the absolute truth, then this yogic process is the only process. As far as the normal events and normal phenomena around us is concerned, we can choose. If we want to choose uh, experimental method, it's fine uh, of the modern science, but uh, when it comes to God, uh, you cannot make experiments with God. You cannot really, you know, kind of dissect him uh, by your uh, scalpel or whatever and see what is inside him. <laughs> you cannot really adopt the uh, usual means of investigation. I'm talking it uh, with the experience because uh, I was trained like a scientist and I remember with great shame and regret how I was uh, cutting the heads of poor rats. They were totally innocent white rats <laughs> and here I am, the seeker of the truth, <laughs> was decapitating them. <laughs> uh, I, I still very ashamed. So, but the point is that you cannot do this with God. 
Mm. But I like it because <laughs> <laughs> otherwise we would <laughs> end it up with God without the head. <laughs> In any case, uh, what I want to say to understand God, we need to adopt a completely different means. And if the method of the material science is to investigate from top down, looking down at the things uh, which are obviously considered to be less uh, complex than we are uh, and uh, uh, are eligible for this analysis and this section and uh, you know this sort of things then uh, God uh, is not eligible for this process because of the simple fact he is much more complex than us he is much more intelligent than us and therefore we cannot really capture him, put him in a cage of our mind and uh, manipulate with him through the means which are available to us. <laughs> so therefore this Dhyan meditation is the only process. It's the only process of uniting with God and by uniting, by the means of uniting, the uniting the hearts on the level of the heart, on a level, on a very deep level, on the level of consciousness, then only uh, we can know something about God. We will never be able to understand Him completely, but if we know, uh, if we want to know something about God, here is the process. Meditation is the process, and in particular, this is uh, process, this process is called meditation on the holy name. Uh, 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 this is something which is available to us uh, in any stage of our life. On the higher levels of spiritual development, uh, there may be some other means of meditation. When God becomes more revealed to us, more visible to us and more tangible reality in our life, uh, then uh, we can meditate on his form, on his qualities, on his pastimes in the spiritual world. Uh, we can have some other means of meditation, some other objects of meditation. But uh, in the beginning stages, uh, the only full, complete, and at the same time uh, merciful uh, object of meditation is his name. Why did I say merciful? Because his name is easily available. It's available. It's, uh, it's there and anyone can adopt uh, the holy name. But there is a trick. So what I want to do, I will uh, read one verse from Srimad Bhagavatam, which speaks a little bit, one of many verses of this uh, scripture uh, of ancient India. Uh, we will read together, we will chant one verse in Sanskrit, and then I will explain uh, how important this process and what it implies uh, taking this verse as the uh, uh, root of my discourse. So this is the mm, 22nd verse of the third chapter of the sixth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam <coughs> and this chapter is called Yamaraja instructs his messengers Etavan Eva Loke Asmin Pumsam Dharmaha Paraha Smritaha Bhakti Yoga, Bhakti Yoga Bhagavati, Bhagavati Tannama Grahanadi Bhi Etavan Evalokesmin Pumsam Dharma Parah Smritaha Bhakti Yoga Bhagavati Tannamo grahana dibi Tannamo grahana dibi Etavan neva lokesmin Etavan neva lokesmin Pumsam dharma parasmritaha Pumsam dharma parasmritaha 
Bhakti Yoga Bhagavati Bhakti Yoga Bhagavati Tannama Grahanadibi Tannama Grahanadibi So Namo Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prestaya Bhutale Srimate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Nitinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Goravani Pracharine Nirvishya Sarsunyavadi Paschatyade Sutarine Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhunityananda Siyadvaita Gadathara Sivasadi Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Tiyan Dach Pravishya Mama Vachim Mam Prasuptam Sanjeevaya Takila Shakti Darak Svadamna Hanyam Shahasta Charana Shravana Dvagadin Pranan Namo Bhagavate Purushay Dubyam So here this verse is spoken by Yamaraj, the Lord of Death in the context of a very beautiful and important story of Srimad Bhagavatam, how the great sinner uh, Ajamila was saved in the last moment of his life because he somehow or other managed to pronounce the name of the Lord. And therefore, uh, all his sins uh, were forgiven. <laughs> And uh, the messengers of uh, heaven released him from the messengers of hell. And uh, of course he had to undergo some sort of purification process further uh, to reach the higher destination. But this near-death experience uh, was very clearly described in Srimad Bhagavatam. Uh, and because the death is a very distinct and uh, 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 inevitable reality which we will face at one point of our life, uh, this story is very le relevant to all of us. And basically this whole story, the point of this whole story is to impress upon us how important it is to meditate on the Holy Name, even though imperfectly. How important uh, for every human being uh, it is to uh, meditate or to chant the holy name. How uh, crucial it is for overall success uh, of our life. And here uh, Dharmaraj or Yamaraj, the Lord of Death, who is called Dharmaraj, which means that he knows Dharma. He knows what morality is. He knows what the duty of the human being is. He says that the highest Dharma, highest possible Dharma, is uh, devotion to God, uh, which starts from Tannamagrahanadi Bih, from the chanting of the Holy Name. He specifically says, that the essential duty of a human being is to chant the holy name. Uh, <clears throat> we may believe him, we may not believe him, it's up to us, but it's not his problem, it's our problem. <laughs> but um, logically speaking, it's better to believe him because <laughs> he knows what he's talking about. <laughs> he basically wants to say again, that, uh, and he says it clearly, if you don't want to see me, you better chant the holy name. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, he specifically says that this is Dharma. And Dharma, the word, the very word Dharma, also quite, also quite famous in the modern uh, culture and the modern world, the word Dharma, Dharma literally means uh, the quality which is innate to us. Like Srila Prabhupada explains that Dharma of sugar was to be sweet. There is no sugar which is not sweet, or if something is not sweet, it's not, it is not sugar. <laughs> so, uh, you know, sugar is known to be sweet. So, in the same way, the Dharma of a living entity, the innate nature of a living entity is to serve God. This notion of uh, service God is all-pervading. 
And uh, even those people uh, who don't believe in God, they still understand that they should serve some higher purpose. There are so many people who don't believe God, but still they try to find the meaning of their life, serving something which is higher than them. You know, of course, nowadays sometimes people say you should love yourself. It's a very ridiculous statement because how you can love yourself, you know? Uh, love means something else. <laughs> love means there is some object of, of my love uh, and I'm sacrificing something for this object. And, uh, but still, most of the people, even nowadays, even in the modern, quite uh, atheistic, materialistic context of our culture, uh, they uh, have this notion that there is a higher purpose of my life. And by serving this higher purpose, I will elevate myself. That will be the means of developing myself uh, as a proper human being. And if I only live for myself, uh, my life will be wasted. Most of the people, they understand it. You know, like, uh, people are ready, uh, especially, you know, in Hare Krishna temple or whatever, but, uh, we like to cook. Uh, people, if they invite guests, they usually cook very elaborate feast or, you know, at least few courses to, to share something with them. But when, when they are alone, you know, they open the fridge and see what is there and <laughs> eat something. So, uh, there is no fun of cooking for yourself. But there is a lot of pleasure when uh, we cook for somebody else. And again, this is uh, this indicates very clearly that by nature we want to serve somebody else. That this is not something foreign, this is not some, you know, strange idea. This is a very natural idea. And therefore Yamaraj says, this is Dharma. Dharma means something which is natural for you. You know, like even people, that's uh, Prabhupada's example, when they become alone, when they become, uh, you know, uh, retired and uh, they have n nobody there to do, then they get some dog and they serve dog. But uh, believe me, there is more pleasure in serving God than serving dog. You will serve anyway, but it's better to serve God. Uh, I mean, there is no harm of serving dog as well, especially if you understand his connection with God. <laughs> <laughs> but serving him alone probably is not so beneficial. <laughs> so, uh, uh, anyway, so uh, that's the point. Uh, Yamaraj here says that this is something essential, something natural, and something very important for us to understand. But then he says how to serve God. What, what is the means of serving God? We don't know God. He is not easily available, of course, some say he is in the altar, some may believe it, some may not believe it. But uh, all the scriptures, they say that uh, the human beings are revealed, that, that uh, the name uh, of God uh, is revealed to the human beings as the means to serve Him, as the means to meditate upon Him. This is, uh, it is stated in the uh, Bible that you shouldn't chant the name of God uh, in, uh, in a hurry when you're not concentrated on it. But uh, there it is said that it's, uh, it's so important. And this mystical thing is stressed practically in every tradition. Uh, that the name of God is the means to approach God. That meditation on repetition of the name of God is the best way to connect with God, to understand God, and uh, to feel His presence in our life. I was uh, uh, present uh, in the Millennium uh, Summit of Religions in New York in the United Nations. And there were all kinds of religions, you know. There were some shamans from Africa with big drums and, uh, you know, very 
funny clothes and there were some uh, native uh, Indians, American Indians, and there were, you know, Hindu tradition, Christian, of course, Muslim tradition, uh, rabbis, and they, they all came together in this United Nations and, uh, you know, the idea was let's unite all religion and let's make religious peace and everything else, but uh, uh, you know, after 15 minutes, it was completely clear that these people have nothing in common with them. <laughs> you know, uh, really, you know, one, one journalist asked me, what, to, what do you think you, uh, we will achieve at the end of this summit? I said, maybe we will finally understand that there is only one God and there is no reason for quarreling. And this journalist was from Japan and he said, I'm a Buddhist, I don't believe in God, there is no God. <laughs> so, that was the end of my uh, interreligious dialogue. <laughs> because this, these people were so different. <laughs> and they, they were dressed differently, they had all kinds of differences. There was hardly anything in common. And I was thinking, what is really uniting them? And one thing I noticed that every person, every speaker who would come on this stage to present uh, his or her views to this esteemed audience, everyone started with the prayer to God. <laughs> so the one thing was definitely in common is that you know, including these African people, they were of course beating the drums, you know, so that God would for sure hear them, you know. <laughs> was quite, quite <laughs> uh, you know, and then uh, Hindus were there, and they were uh, conch, they were glowing conch, and you know. But, so, everyone believed that to approach God, you can approach God through the sound. And, through the specific form of sound, and the specific form of sound is the holy name. It's the name of God, and there is a mystery which is revealed in many, many religious traditions, uh, many different religious traditions, uh, and the mystery is simple, but very difficult to understand. Simple to say, uh, but very difficult to conceive, and the mystery is that the holy name is not different from the Lord. That this is the full representation of the Lord, somehow or other. Even though it's not perceivable uh, for us on our present level of consciousness. But nevertheless, uh, the holy name is the absolute truth. And by meditating, ultimately uh, going deeper and deeper in this meditation, we will be able to uh, unite with God on a very deep level and understand Him. Because He will, uh, revealed, uh, uh, he will reveal Himself to us being pleased for performing this duty, this Dharma. So this is the point of this verse where uh, uh, Yamaraj very clearly says, Pumsam Dharma, Loke, in this world, Loke Asmin, in this world, uh, the highest Dharma, Pumsa uh, Dharma Parah Smritaha, is Bhakti Yoga Bhagavati, is the Bhakti Yoga or devotion uh, to Bhagavan which is based uh, on the chanting of the holy name, Tam Nama Grahanadi Bhi. So let me speak a little bit about this means and uh, how, how it works and uh, because that's the main subject of our meditation. You know, the scriptures of different traditions glorify this process. And they say that you basically can achieve anything by chanting the holy name. In our tradition, we chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. In some other tradition, they chant something else. Uh, but um, mm, uh, it's not a problem because God is unlimited and therefore He has unlimited names. Names. Uh, His names can be revealed differently to different people. But what I want to say here is that even though there is so much glorification of this process, how powerful it is, how uh, transforming it is, sometimes we may uh, 
be forced to think while trying and sincerely believing in this, uh, while trying to do this process, we may doubt if it's true or not. Does this process really, uh, uh, has this process really, uh, does this process have all these effects which are described, or this is some sort of exaggeration? <coughs> or this is some sort of a trick to engage us in some activity, at least we will not do something harmful to others. Uh, sometimes this explanation is also given, just chant and, uh, you know, it will not be so bad for others if you spend your time by <laughs> chanting the holy name. So, one very important thing and very, very important consideration about this process is that if we believe that the Holy Name is not different from God Himself, if the Holy Name is really the person uh, whom we are trying to meditate and uh, it's not just a simple sound, material sound, uh, usual sound which we adopt uh, every now and then, then we also have to understand that the Holy Name behaves like a person. It's a conscious person. It's not just an unconscious object. It's not just the sound produced uh, by our tongue. And because we have difficulty to believe in it, because we have difficulty to, to relate to this notion uh, that the Holy Name is a conscious subject, not an object, uh, then uh, while trying to meditate on the Holy Name, we uh, inevitably or uh, unconsciously, by habit, uh, treat the sound of the Holy Name as the uh, ordinary sound. And that's the problem. That's the mistake which practically everyone who is trying to adopt this means of meditation, who is trying to uh, approach God through this meditation, this is the mistake which everyone commits. I want to tell you a little uh, parable, a little story, uh, which uh, very clearly uh, uh, illustrates uh, this point. <coughs> So the story goes like this, that there was one uh, very great guru and he was living in the forest in a little ashram with his few disciples and he was, you know, teaching them the secrets of spiritual life and uh, the secrets of spiritual practice, secrets of yoga and one day he was away from his ashram and his disciples were there and one man came uh, to this uh, lonely ashram and he was very morose uh, and he found the disciple who was who looked very bright and very powerful and he said you know uh, your guru is not here but maybe you can help me I have a big problem my young son who is a teenager is sick and nobody can help him and he's his disease is just, you know, taking toll and uh, inevitably he will die. Can you please do something about it? Uh, and this disciple, he um, smiled very bright and he said, there's no problem. You know, holy name is so powerful. You please write the holy name of Ram three times on a paper with a very prayerful and meditative mood and then you uh, take this uh, paper uh, with the name of Ram uh, and you pour some water on this name uh, and then you give this water to your son and your son will be relieved from his disease. So this man went home and next the day uh, he came there completely joyful. He said, it works, it works, it works. Uh, it really works. And uh, he, he found the Guru. Guru has come back. And Guru said, what works? He said, your disciple is really, I mean, you have a good disciple. He gave me such a good 
advice. He said to me that I should write, my son was very sick, that I should write the name of Ram three times and then pour water and give it uh, to my son. And sure enough, my son was cured. And when the guru heard this, he became so angry. He called his disciples and said, you are an atheist. You are a non-believer. You don't believe in the power of the holy name. Why did you say to this man to write the name of Ram three times? Even one is enough. <laughs> there is no need to write three times. You don't believe in the power completely. You just, you just have some doubts and just in case let's write too many times. <laughs> so, uh, he chastised him and he said, just go away from him. <laughs> and uh, uh, his disciple became very morose and he started begging forgiveness from his guru. And guru, uh, he kind of uh, forgave his disciple, but he knew that he needs uh, to show something. He needs to teach his disciple uh, a lesson. And therefore, he somehow, from some hidden place, procured a uh, precious stone, a very sparkling bright stone of big size. And he gave it to his disciple, and he said, you please take this stone, and uh, you go to the city, and you go to different people in the market, and uh, you ask them, uh, uh, what is the price of this stone? But don't sell it. Don't be in a hurry. Just go to different, different people and ask what is their estimate? What is the price? What would they give uh, if you were to sell the stone? So the disciple uh, enthusiastically went to the market and uh, he came to uh, some uh, vegetable seller and he showed her the stone and he said, would you like to have this stone? Uh, she said, yes, yeah, sure, nice stone, looks nice. So, uh, uh, what would you like to give uh, in exchange for this stone? She said, yeah, one kilo of potato is fine. Uh, not more than one kilo. <laughs> then he went further, you know, he was asking different people, somebody said, few rupees, uh, it was in India, somebody, uh, you know, then he went to a, a goldsmith ultimately. And Goldsmith looked at it and said, oh, this is a nice stone, you know, I can give you 1,000 rupees. And he went further to a jewelers and jewelers saw and he said, oh, phew, uh, one crore, no problem, I can give you easily one crore. And every time he would say, excuse me, uh, I, this, uh, this stone is not for sale, this stone is for understand the, uh, the value of this stone. Then he went to the council of five best jewelers and they were you know they were discussing among themselves what would be the proper price and ultimately they say uh, you know 10 crores 10 crores means uh, 100 million rupees we're ready to give and uh, you know the more the disciple would go from each people to each people his respect towards this stone would grow more and more and he was you know, this, is, this is definitely more than one kilo of potato. <laughs> then finally he came to the king and he showed the, uh, the stone to the king and the king invited all of his ministers and jewelers and uh, they were discussing, discussing and ultimately they say if you give half of your kingdom then maybe this would be the good price and uh, of course the disciple was very afraid that if he will refuse then you know will be put in prison but somehow rather he said my guru didn't allow me uh, to sell this stone and therefore uh, uh, his uh, king uh, very respectfully said you please go to the guru and please ask if we can uh, buy this stone in exchange of half of the kingdom so he came back and he said, oh, this is an amazing stone. Everyone uh, values this stone differently. And, uh, and uh, the king asked, uh, no, sorry, uh, his guru asked, uh, what about your opinion? How much does this stone, uh, you think, cost? He said, 
half of the kingdom as a good price. <laughs> I really advise you to go for it. <laughs> and Guru said, you're a fool. <laughs> so, uh, he asked the disciple to bring some iron things and he touched this iron thing and this iron uh, turned into gold and he said, actually this is the philosopher's uh, stone. And this philosopher's stone can turn some base metal into gold. So uh, there is no price uh, in this world which could really uh, be adequate to this stone. Uh, and of course the, the moral of the story which was explained by Guru to his disciple is that uh, this is the holy name. Holy name is very precious, but everyone looks at the holy name according to the level of his consciousness. Somebody can say, oh yeah, holy name is as good as one kilo of potato. <laughs> you know, and that's exactly what, me, what it means to, you know, to uh, uh, chant the holy name, the name of God uh, in vanity or how you say not in vanity? Anyway, uh, this Bible in Rush or whatever. Uh, uh, in between, uh, it really uh, means that uh, there is no genuine appreciation and genuine understanding what holy name is and what it can give. So the secret of this meditation is simple but at the same time is difficult to realize is that uh, we should understand the, the potency, the glory, the real value of the holy name. Then only this real glory and the value of the holy name will be revealed to us. The theoretical understanding of the power and uh, importance of the Holy Name should come first. And then when this understanding comes to us and we chant the Holy Name in the proper frame of mind, with the proper reverence, uh, with the proper attitude, then uh, the Holy Name uh, will gradually, gradually uh, reveal all its powers to us. So, you know, this little face has to be in the beginning because without face, our practice will be very neglectful. Even in the uh, physical practice of Hatha Yoga, uh, people nowadays are very fond of uh, practicing Hatha Yoga. But even there, they say, for having the full effect of doing asanas, you have to be completely conscious of what you're doing. You cannot really hear something and, you know, do... Even, uh, you know, the real yogis, uh, in yoga studio you go and they play some music there and then you do some yoga. Uh, this is not the yoga, this is entertainment. This is not the real spiritual process. Spiritual process implies complete concentration on what you are doing. With full reverence. In fact, according to uh, Patanjali Muni, according to Yoga Sutra, uh, the spiritual practice only become practice if it is performed with the proper attitude, with the proper frame of mind, with the proper reverence. So, uh, that's the simple secret of this uh, Holy Name meditation. And of course, uh, you know, when we are neglectful, when we are inattentive, when we are distracted in our mind, it's better uh, not to uh, chant the Holy Name. And the gravest, uh, the gravest offense, one of the most grave offenses against the Holy Name uh, is uh, to commit the sins, uh, considering the Holy Name as the means of salvation from the sins. You know, we, the idea here is that we are chanting the Holy Name to please the Lord. But if we are chanting the Holy Name uh, to please ourselves by committing sins uh, and uh, relieving ourselves from the sins, uh, we are only digging our own grave. So oftentimes people do this mistake, and oftentimes people, uh, they are uh, not properly understanding the gravity of this process. This process was 
experienced by many, many people, thousands and, you know, hundreds and even millions of people uh, in the history of humanity. And uh, they know, they testify by their own experience that Holy Name can give you all the mystic powers, can give you intuition, can give you the ability to see the future, uh, it can give you material results. But uh, first and foremost, the Holy Name can give you attachment to God, can give you this union, mystical union with God, which will make you completely happy because God is the most happiest personality uh, in the creation. <laughs> It can give you this amazing power of feeling that you are united with God uh, on the level of the heart. Not united in an improper sense, but you are united with Him uh, as uh, somebody who loves you and uh, somebody whom you love. You are united with Him uh, through the love. So, when we consider the Holy Name as the giver of some material benefits, it's the same as to exchange and this philosopher's stone, this precious stone, into some potatoes. Yes, the Holy Name can give you potatoes, no problem. And it can give you even, you know, better things. Your whole uh, Swiss cheese can, only, can also be obtained through and a lot of ice cream, you know? <laughs> but, but, yeah, the Holy Name can give you money, the Holy Name can give you mystical abilities, the Holy Name can purify your heart from the sins. Uh, there is no doubt about it. This is the point which is uh, being made uh, in this story. It can relieve you from committed uh, sinful activities. You will feel completely free from or all the uh, accumulated uh, impressions of the sins. But uh, the main benefit of the Holy Name is this attachment to the Lord, which includes everything else. If you have the Lord in your life, you have everything else, your refrigerator will definitely be full as well. Because God is full of opulences. Uh, to fill up your refrigerator is not a difficult thing for Him. So, uh, uh, you will have whatever you need. There is no doubt about it. But you will have much more than you think you need. You will have God. You will have uh, this understanding that God is there and God is there for you personally. <laughs> so, that's uh, that's the mystery and that's the simple and most important rule of this meditation. Meditation is simple, we should just repeat Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. But not as a tedious and uh, uh, difficult practice, not as a something which we have forced to do because of the fear, but as something which is natural to us, with some natural feeling of affection, natural feeling of initial affection, which is not uh, very deep, but uh, with the feeling of gratitude. That's a very important point, which is again made uh, many times in Srimad Bhagavatam, that uh, the spiritual practice uh, starts at the point uh, when the tiny uh, living entity understands uh, our dependence on God. If we understand that whatever we need is ultimately given by God and it's ultimately uh, provided to us by, uh, by God to to facilitate our existence in this material world and our creation, then uh, we will chant initially the Holy Name with little simple gratitude. This is my Dharma. This is what I'm supposed to do. This is what I'm meant to do. <laughs> in the 10th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, this will be the last point which I will uh, make because even though we are Indian religion, but still we are in Switzerland and I have to follow <laughs> The, <laughs> the rules of the land <laughs> so, and should not delay this lecture too late uh, so uh, the last point which I wanted to make 
by explaining uh, the uh, this notion that chanting of the holy name is not optional it's dharma it's our nature it's something which we should do and which feels natural actually i remember my own experience when i I just started chanting the holy name uh, and uh, uh, my initial condition, my friend told me just chant it and let's see what happens. And I, uh, because I was a scientist, I thought, okay, let me do this experiment. I don't mind, uh, you know, it's my life is miserable enough, let me try something else, maybe it will work. <laughs> so, uh, I'll... Uh, I started it by my initial condition was that at the moment uh, when uh, I will become completely sick and tired of it, I will stop it. You know, 43 years later I'm still chanting the holy name. So it, it was a long experiment. <laughs> still didn't reach the end. So, but uh, the simple point which, um, well, maybe not so simple, but uh, the point which I want to make at the end, uh, I want to <coughs> quote a verse from the 10th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, uh, a quite mysterious verse and very interesting philosophical verse. I will not be able to explain all the philosophical implications of this verse, uh, but uh, some simple idea, some superficial idea of this verse I will convey because it's closely related to the topic uh, we're talking about. Uh, this is the verse from 87, the last chapter of uh, 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 Srimad Bhagavatam, where uh, Sukadev Goswami, the speaker of Srimad Bhagavatam, explains the purpose of this creation. Uh, sometimes people wonder why God created this world. Didn't he have enough headache, uh, you know, and uh, that was the reason he wanted to have some, you know, some people say that he created this world and, you know, why did he create this world so imperfect? Uh, and some people say that this was a, uh, how you say this, better version? You know, like uh, the computer programmers, they make the better version of the program and they, they give this uh, program to the users and users find some bugs in the program and then they return it back the programmer to... So some say that uh, God is, I mean, he is nice, he is well uh, meaning but not really completely perfect and therefore cre he created this imperfect world. So. Uh, this verse beautifully explains the reason of creation and the purpose of this world. And in this verse, Shukadev Goswami says that there are three purposes of this world. That this whole creation, our material existence, our life, if we want to understand uh, what is the meaning, what is the purpose, what uh, we are supposed to achieve, uh, then uh, this verse answers. Uh, uh, in a very beautiful way. He says that the first purpose is uh, mantrartha. Mantrartha means matrartha. It's not mantrartha. <laughs> matrartha. Uh, for the purpose of us enjoying this world. That's a nice, nice purpose. I'm sure you're all delighted uh, to hear that God was having our enjoyment in mind. Uh, while creating this world. <laughs> uh, uh, this is the first purpose, obvious purpose. God has created this world and God has created our bodies in such a way that our senses can uh, contact the sense objects of this world and enjoy. There are so many tastes, there are so many colors, so many smells, uh, so many uh, nice touches and so on and so forth. Matra, matra means the senses because they are very inquisitive and they want to experience different material pleasurable experiences. And there is no doubt about it, it's one of the purposes of the world. But of course, uh, God himself puts limitation on this. He says, if you want to only, uh, if you want to have happy life, then please follow certain rules, restrict 
your uh, your desire to enjoy the senses by certain rules you know you shouldn't do this you should not do this you shouldn't inflict harm you shouldn't kill other uh, living entities you should not eat meat and so on and so forth so this is implied but still you know uh, because we want to experience this world uh, God uh, is uh, has created this world for us to do and then uh, Bhavanaya, the next Bhavartham, Bhavartham, the next uh, Bhavarthaya, Bhavarthaya. Uh, the next uh, purpose of the creation was uh, to evolve. It's very interesting. Uh, God has created this world in a very specific way. He did create the world to give us experience which we want but he also wants us to evolve he also wants us to develop our consciousness he doesn't want us to uh, remain on a very primitive level by just interacting materially and bavarta um, uh, means to uh, you know to go from lifetime to lifetime and at the same time developing our consciousness our understanding deepening our understanding this is the second purpose of creation of the uh, world and uh, kalpanaya uh, the third uh, or akalpanaya it doesn't matter <coughs> and there could be variant readings in this but the meaning is the same uh, and ultimately he created this world uh, the third and the highest uh, purpose of God's creating this world is for us when we develop enough through this chain of uh, reincarnation uh, to develop the uh, highest possible fruit of spiritual development which is love of God. And in this way uh, to change our status existential status and achieve spiritual status achieve and understand our spiritual identity not remain uh, within this temporary and changing uh, identity and ultimately uh, the three purposes if we keep them in mind then we will understand all the so-called or apparent uh, imperfections imperfections of this world because these three purposes uh, have to be achieved and all the uh, miseries and sufferings which are there this is actually impetus for our spiritual development uh, for us going higher and higher understanding the deeper purpose not to remain on this uh, primitive level of uh, simple uh, sense enjoyers uh, so the ultimate purpose is to achieve love of God and the means of achieving love of God is simple. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Trying again and again to concentrate our mind on the sound of the holy name with reverence, with understanding the importance of, of this process, and ultimately, uh, very quickly, uh, we will be given the great gifts which Holy Name is capable of give to us. So, thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much, Guru Maharaj. Sometimes, or maybe always, the mind may be active or overactive while chanting, so which uh, leaves the the idea of meditating on the sound, uh, yeah, makes it all, almost impossible. So, like, what is the best meditation when the when the thoughts are active? We like, are we praying for purification? Are we praying for service? Are we praying to just for the pleasure of the Lord? Uh, you know, we are praying for what we are capable to pray for. <laughs> if we don't really feel that we need, and we are trying to pray for something which we don't really need, uh, Krishna is not fool. He will immediately detect 
uh, this sort of insincerity in our prayer. So we should pray for what, uh, you know, Krishna knows what we really want. We may say, oh my dear Krishna, I want the I want, uh, love of God. And Krishna, Krishna notices the little pause between love and God. <laughs> And he understands that the real object of our love is not him <laughs> yet. <laughs> so, you know, initially, uh, purification of the heart is, a, is, a, is a relevant. If I understand that we need purification, then we need to purify the heart. Uh, it's, it's relevant, so we can uh, pray meaningfully or with some feelings. Anyway, something which is relevant to you, but at the same time, not too far away from what uh, the Lord would like you to pray for. <laughs> I have a question. Yes, please. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. Um, so you talked about the holy name. Um, my question is, are there any qualifications required to chant the holy names, like past, past life karmas or any other factors which, um, uh, which encourages you to chant the holy names or anybody can chant? Because I, I have seen people, even if you tell them hundred times, they don't say Hare Krishna. So <laughs> that's my question. <coughs> There is no preliminary qualification. The only qualification is to have a tongue. That's required. But, you know, I've seen people who, who were even deaf, uh, and they were chanting the holy name, and they developed some ability. But um, what is the most... Uh, but you, you definitely mean something else. Uh, why some people develop the desire to do it, and other people don't. So, mm, the reason uh, actually is not the past karma, because if it was uh, for our past karma uh, to be the deciding factor, uh, then uh, uh, the holy name would not be powerful enough to overcome the past karma. Uh, Thinking that the past karma is the deciding factor, we uh, uh, inadvertently uh, placing uh, past karma over the holy name. <laughs> so definitely the holy name can overcome our past karma, uh, but uh, of course, uh, you know, there the need to be some sort of uh, agent which would uh, uh, help uh, the person to understand despite the layer of uh, ignorance of a video which is covering the consciousness. Uh, you know, past sins, uh, they make us very ignorant. Uh, the sinful activities make us very gross and uh, they make our mind attached to uh, repetition of the sins. Uh, you know, the people's, the, the verdict of the scriptures is that uh, it's not your pious credits uh, which is uh, helpful for you to chant the holy name or to understand its uh, importance. And it's not your sinful uh, disadvantages uh, which uh, uh, prohibit you from chanting it. But uh, it's the mercy of those people who want you uh, to chant the holy name. <laughs> it's, it's the mercy of saintly people. Uh, you know, the holy name, the sound of the holy name uh, is also invested uh, by the consciousness uh, of the chanter of the holy name. The holy name is powerful, uh, but uh, when we are uh, conditioned living entities, hear the holy name, if this holy name is invested with the pure consciousness or pure desire of uh, a saintly person, then it's more powerful. So, 
Uh, still, uh, some people may reject the holy name. It's not a panacea. Uh, I mean, it's not uh, the universal recipe. Uh, but mm, uh, therefore, uh, the real recipe to receive the holy name is uh, to hear the holy name from a holy person, from a saintly person, uh, but to hear the holy name from the saintly person with a proper reverence and proper attitude. If this condition is there, then very easily uh, people can appreciate or feel some sort of uh, special feeling uh, which is coming from the chanting of the Holy Name. But if uh, we consciously neglectful or spiteful uh, uh, towards the uh, holy persons, then you know, we will have to wait till the next opportunity and maybe we will become humble enough at that time to receive the holy name from him or her. Okay. Thank you, Maharaj. Yes. Maharaj, uh, should we try to develop this yogi uh, pratyaksha and then, yogi cha pratyaksha. and then the holy name will reveal uh, if we make this fusion with the holy name? Uh, no, it's not really necessary, but we should try to meditate properly. Uh, you know, we should understand that meditation is a scientific process and it requires uh, certain material conditions to be successful. I mean, especially in the beginning, uh, when we achieve the real experience of the real Holy Name. In the beginning, we are just chanting the shadow of the Holy Name, not the Holy Name itself. Uh, but, uh, you know, m meditation is a certain process and uh, uh, it's uh, desirable to follow the rules of meditation to achieve uh, a good experience in meditation, especially in the beginning. One of the rules of meditation is that your spine uh, should be straight. It's almost impossible for uh, uh, modern people, you know, <laughs> sitting like this, <laughs> used to sit in front of the computer. But it's important that the spine is straight and that your head is there, and then you are in a certain position which helps uh, your prana, your uh, energy to move uh, upwards, not downwards. Because we are still very much depend on our body and uh, the, the rules of meditation uh, actually help us to mm, concentrate the mind. You know, and uh, as uh, Balaram Pran Prabhu said, our mind is very active, our mind is very, you know, actually mad and running here and there. And uh, mm, therefore meditation is difficult in this regard. So these rules, uh, they are necessary to preliminary calm the mind to bring our mind into the condition which is conducive for our meditation. So in this sense, uh, your suggestion is correct. Uh, we should know. Uh, and Prabhupada, he did give uh, some uh, conditions. He said, you should sit properly, you should chant, you should not. Mm, you should not be consciously distracted. You know, if the mind is behaving its own way and, you know, running here and there, that's fine, but you are not the mind. And you have the ability to bring your mind back onto meditation. And that's the process, that's the initial struggle which we all have. You know, the mind is running somewhere with some brilliant ideas usually, uh, especially during Japa meditation. So many brilliant ideas are coming to our mind. Uh, but we say, let's wait with these brilliant ideas. Now I am doing something very important. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna. So in this sense, you're right. Yes. Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you for a wonderful class. Hare Krishna, I would like to ask if you kindly would care to share with us some of your experience, 43 years of chanting, and it would be inspiring to hear. If you had a moment that you feel, wow, the acharyas are right, or whatever, 
for some special connection, if you would like. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> my, my experience is that the holy name is completely independent. And uh, he, he will do whatever he likes to do. Sometimes he comes in a very unexpected way. Uh, he descends from somewhere and you feel so. And, and then you become a little proud that you uh, look how spiritual I am. And then the life, dis the name disappears, leaves you alone with your pride. And <laughs> <laughs> sitting there mumbling something <laughs> meaningless <laughs> so uh, my experience is that uh, when all of a sudden you, you become humble and you consider yourself as an instrument not as the doer of this chanting but as an instrument uh, and uh, if you have some noble ideas and noble you know aspirations uh, then the holy name becomes merciful, but then you know all of a sudden it leaves you alone, and uh, again you are in this desert of uh, uh, of your own dry mind. <laughs> so, and uh, uh, you know I gave so many lectures on this topic, uh, and of course it's nice because uh, you know if we offend somebody we should glorify the same person to beg forgiveness so by speaking about this I am begging forgiveness from the holy name <laughs> for my uh, uh, conscious and unconscious offenses uh, but uh, uh, really and usually the expectation is there uh, here we are we will listen this lecture and we will find out some trick by which we can <laughs> uncover uh, the powers of the holy name yeah there is no trick uh, the trick is only one is just to humbly chant the holy name again and again and again without expecting anything and uh, yeah sometimes holy name reveals you know I, I had fortunate enough uh, to have some sort of amazing experience which are totally uh, not uh, of this world when the holy name is just doing amazing things <laughs> uh, when uh, when your perception of the world is completely changed because of the holy name and you start seeing the world in a different way and your heart uh, uh, is completely free from all these petty uh, feelings and emotions and you are just open to love everyone so it's there but there is no point of uh, describing it, there is a point of serving the Holy Name so that the Holy Name would give you this experience. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. In your um, description, you drew a connection between genuine appreciation and sincerity. And um, I don't know if my question is really a question, but more of a reflection that I find that um, there is some appreciation, and I think if the appreciation was really genuine, there would have been more sincerity in chanting uh, Japa. And some sort of sincerity I can still find in Kirtan, in singing the Kirtan. I, I, I do feel okay, there is some sincerity. But with Japa, I feel it's a very different experience. Perhaps you could um, address this in some manner. <coughs> I, I didn't elaborate on this uh, during the lecture, but uh, there was a very important point when I was speaking at the end about the three purposes of creation. That the uh, Lord has created this world for us to get some nice, happy experience, and also for us to develop, and ultimately for us to uh, leave this world uh, by obtaining uh, very amazing spiritual experience which uh, helps us to reject uh, all other petty experiences. Uh, I was saying this and there uh, uh, 
Shukadev Goswami says, cha cha cha, three times he repeats uh, the uh, uh, word cha, which means end, and this, and this, and this. And uh, the commentators of this verse, they explain that he repeats this word end three times to stress that uh, we are dependent on the Lord in everything. Uh, in our material existence, uh, He provided us with the senses, uh, with the ability to have nice experience, with the object of the senses. You know, He gave us such beautiful places. You know, I'm walking this Zurich and I'm amazed how such a nice city. I, I fell in love with this city. I really wasted 16 years of my life <laughs> not coming here. <laughs> The Lord gave us uh, these experiences, material experience, nice material experiences. Uh, the Lord gave us the ability and the sense of development, which is also nice. Otherwise, we would remain like a, uh, like a worm and would be completely happy. But even the worm has some sort of feeling within his heart. I don't know if he has heart or not, but uh, he feels the need to become a, a better worm. <laughs> and develop <laughs> caterpillar or whatever then and from caterpillar to butterfly so he gave us this opportunity and then he also gave us the final opportunity to achieve the highest spiritual experience this is the purpose of his creation and if we meditate on this and understand that he is behind this he is providing us with with all this, then the gratitude will be natural. Why we don't feel grateful to the Lord? Because we usually are very conscious of what we don't have. Instead of being conscious of what we already have. Uh, if we would concentrate of, on what we have uh, and, you know, be overwhelmed with the gratitude because the Lord has already given to us uh, so much, uh, then the gratitude would be very natural, whereas we're always in this mentality, oh, yeah, 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 why it's not better? Why, you know, why this world is so bad? Why it's not better? Why it's like this? It's like this? It's like this? Come on, we don't, you know, if, if I'm grateful, if we're coming, somebody, just imagine you have a friend and this friend is providing you with so many things and, you know, and then uh, ultimately, uh, you know, he gave you the uh, house to live and he provided you with the nice furniture and, you know, the... Uh, bathroom is there and the kitchen all equipped is there and then you come to him and you said uh, you know so thank you very much but you forget the turmeric in the kitchen why didn't you give me this <laughs> and you are very angry with him because he didn't provide you with this so the gratitude is actually a very simple sort of feeling uh, it naturally comes if we meditate on what we have, not uh, if we meditate on something which we lack, which is our habit. I don't have this, I don't have that, but uh, if this simple, uh, you know, way of thinking is coming to us, thank you for this and thank you for that. Thank you for this day, thank you for my ability to see, thank you for my ability to hear. I have a disciple of mine, uh, she, <clears throat> she's a nice lady, and she, at one point, she started becoming deaf. And uh, uh, this deafness was progressing rapidly, rapidly, rapidly. And she imagined how it will be, you know, how her life would be without the ability to hear the Holy Name, to hear the lectures, to hear. And she became so immensely grateful that she has this ability still, <laughs> even though it's uh, impaired. Uh, who of us is grateful that we can hear? No, we are not grateful. <laughs> Whereas it's, the, it's such a great gift which is given to us by God. So if we meditate on this, and ultimately because of your gratefulness, uh, she still can hear. <laughs> she still, you know, something changed and this disease which was 
uh, her, her deafness, which was inevitable, you know, left her, and she still can hear. So this is what I uh, this is what I mean. If we meditate on what we have, simple gifts of we have, you know, like also I know one person who has asthma, and he said, you don't understand what a great gift it is to breathe, unless you all of a sudden lose this gift. And you cannot just, you, you, you feel, you cannot breathe. So, if we're grateful to the Lord for what He gave, uh, by thinking about it again and again and again, then uh, the chanting in a proper mood will come automatically. Okay, I guess it's too late. Thank you very much. Sila Prabhupada ki jai, si si gornita ki jai, si si jaganat baladev subhadra mai ki jai. Your devotees, now you are all invited to take prashadam in the garden. Oh, some prashadam is flying in. So I guess Maharaj will be distributing it to all of you. And just for those of you who are new, at 6.15 there will be a chapel meditation in the temple room. So you can try to practically apply what you heard today. And at 7 o'clock is going to be Gora Arati. Hare Krishna. <laughs> Thank you.